We thank you that through our Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful Messiah, our Redeemer, our Lord, we have everlasting life. And thank you that we presently have a great high priest in the heavens who daily prays for us. And I pray that that present ministry of our Lord will hit us with great impact and encouragement today. We thank you in the precious name of our Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's begin with the ascension. Open your Bibles to Acts 1. Acts 1. We want to deal very simply in our discussion of the ascension and present ministry of Christ with just three major things. One, the place where he ascended into heaven. We'll just look briefly at it, but it established the historicity of our Lord. Uh, secondly, we want to spend some time with the position that he now has in heaven, and we'll talk a little bit about how a lot of Christians are a little fuzzy on this. And then third, we'll look at the purpose which is a wonderful, wonderful section, the purpose of his ascension and present ministry. In Acts 1-9, when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, doesn't say they're angels, stood by them in white apparel. They might be angels, might be Moses and Elijah, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Our English word theater is used there. It's talking about a prolonged looking. It was not a quick glance. Uh, the text does seem to suggest that his ascension was slow and not rapid. Almost in dramatic form. And they are constantly watching as that cloud received him from their sight. You can imagine what they felt. What if you were there? And the one you'd loved and served and died on the cross and rose again, the one that the women grabbed and said, we're not letting you go this time. And he said, no, I, I, I need to ascend to my father. Stop clinging to me. You had him for 40 days, and now there he goes. They didn't have a Bible like you have, New Testament, to read, nor did they carry around their private copy of the Tanakh or the Old Testament. What would, what would you have thought? And these two men said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you theatering, gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. I'd like to suggest that that is referring not to the rapture, but to his revelation at the end of the tribulation, when every eye will see him, because at the rapture we meet him in the air, and the world does not see it. Chapter 2, Peter's message, interestingly, brings it up. It's only 10 days later, verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we're all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted. Well, he had to get some information about that, didn't he? In the ten days since he ascended. Being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. And I love this next verse. David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. From Psalm 110. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans is the Magna Carta of Christianity, you know, the Constitution. Romans 8.34 says, 
Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So there's an issue of triumph, victory. He died, rose again. He's now at the right hand of God. Acceptance by God, approval, as well as a ministry in our behalf. And we'll say more about that in a moment. But there's your first indication of what he's doing up there. He's making intercession for us. Intercession is one of the words for prayer. For instance, in 1 Timothy 2.1, uh, we have a list of the kinds of things we do in prayer. Supplications, prayers, giving of thanks, and intercessions. The Greek word means kind of to fall into and it's not talking about falling into a ditch, but it's talking about falling into a close relationship with somebody. For instance, you could use that if uh, you were intimate friends with somebody. Um, and it's like, we even kind of have a takeoff of that if you think about it when we say, you've fallen in love. Well, you don't mean you tripped and fell. But you've fallen in love with this person. It's, it's the word from intercession, you're falling into somebody. And isn't it interesting that our Lord would describe that? He wouldn't just say he's praying for us. He wouldn't just say um, that he's asking God to do something for us. He would say that he's giving intercessions for us. A close, intimate caring of everything that goes on in your life. I think that's beautiful. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul gives some more information about this ascension into heaven in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 what is the exceeding he wants us to know what's the exceeding greatness of his power toward us to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead now we all say that takes the mighty power of God well this takes the power of God also and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And now we have this additional thought. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all, presumably all the believers, in all, meaning in every situation of life the preeminence of our Lord in our lives. Beautiful text. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, he gives a very stunning analysis of the matter of why he's given gifted men to the church to equip us for ministry. He said in verse 8, Wherefore he saith, quoting from Psalm 68, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts. The Greek word is doma, not charisma. He's not talking about charismatic gifts there. Charismatic gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. Doma, or domatic gifts, are referring to people who have been given by Christ since he is gone. Now that he ascended, says verse 9, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Some say that refers to the difference between the cross and the resurrection. Him going down to Sheol, Hades, proclaiming a gospel that certainly was judgment. The reality of what they had rejected would be facing them. To the pre-flood generation that were spirits in prison, mentioned in 1 Peter 3, 19. And uh, took captive captive would mean the Old Testament saints would be taken to heaven. There does appear to be a change in the location of paradise. To the thief and the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jews always thought of the believer as going to paradise. Sheol, the grave, had two compartments in it. One for the wicked, one for the righteous. A great gulf fixed between the two of them. Jesus verified that that is the truth when he told the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. But it was commonly held among the Jews, taught by former rabbis. Now, he took captivity captive, could be the Old Testament saints to heaven. That's the view I prefer. But in all fairness, 
There are many Bible teachers that say, no, this is talking about his humiliation, leaving heaven's glory, coming to earth, that earth is the lower parts, meaning he descended and he ascended far above all the heavens. Uh, I prefer the first view, though it's more complicated. Now, also, interestingly, in Philippians 2, we have an additional remark by Paul. He apparently uh, loved to speak about the ascension and present ministry of Christ. That might be good instruction to all of us to spend a little more time with it. In Philippians 2, 9, after telling us about the person of Christ, both God and man, that he had gone to the cross, he said, Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Now, there is a play on words here. The word exalted means to lift up. This same word appears in John 3, 14. That as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I just got through saying that he became obedient unto death, verse 8, even the death of a cross. Wherefore, God has highly lifted him up. It's playing on the idea that when anyone's put on the cross, they're lifted up on the cross. And then it's, you know, jammed into the ground. And God said, well, you may think that as being disgraceful and shameful and awful, but I see it as glory. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Galatians 6, 14. So God highly exalted him, a play on the ascension, referring to the cross. If he was still on the cross or dead or still in the tomb, uh, obviously there is no Christianity. He gave him a name which is above every name. And now we learn the purpose of the ascension, the exaltation of Christ, is to cause us to fall at his feet. Not to sit at the cross and have pity on a dead Savior. He rose from the dead. He has been exalted by our God. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. I remember an old man years ago back in Ohio when I was pastoring. Every time I would say Jesus, he'd get out of his seat and get on his knees. I couldn't figure out for the life of me what he was doing. And um, so I asked him what he was doing. He said, well, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. So he wanted to do it. You know, we might smile at that, but I think he might have had something that maybe we need to think about. The Lord was exalted at the right hand of God that every one of us would bow the knee and proclaim him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, sometimes we read verses without understanding the context. The context is that he is exalted. And now that he's ascended, what is the proper response of the believer? It is worship, bowing in his presence, confessing that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Isn't that good stuff? Don't miss those. In Colossians 3, 1, it's like Paul can't stop referring to it. Maybe some have said because he had an encounter with the exalted Christ on the Damascus Road. In Colossians 3, 1, if you then be risen with Christ, if and it is so in Greek grammar, since we would say in English, you've been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Apparently, Paul wants us to keep thinking about where he is. Lady told me that Jesus had come to visit her in her room last night, sat on her bed and talked to her. I listened to her, and she said, what do you think of that? I said, I think you might have had chili to eat. <laughs> you might be on medication, had a bad dream, but Jesus did not 
come to your room. My blessed Lord will not be coming that way. He is at the right hand of the throne of God, exalted above every name, and he wants you to worship and bow in his presence. We say a lot of silly things sometimes, don't we? Set your affection on things above. I like that. I know my, many of you have the word mind there, but there's something about the word affection out of the old King James vocabulary that to me still tells it better than just set your mind there. You see, the mind is very much what your heart is. I think we're confused on that one also. Because we know the pumping organ is located about 18 inches from where your brain is, we have the idea these are separated. No, they aren't. The heart thinks, it reasons, and it perceives, and it knows. And I think because of modern communication, we talk about, oh, I love you with all my heart, which means you can check your brains off and just feel something. That is not biblical. Sometimes people say, you know, you just got a head knowledge. Boy, you don't have a heart knowledge. I, I know what you mean. What you mean is they may not have applied the facts that they have learned. But don't you ever come to believe that Christianity is not based on head knowledge. Thank God it's one of the only religions in the world that doesn't ask you to set aside your brain in order to believe it. God wants you to understand it, wants you to search it, wants you to examine it, study it. He wants you to be like the Brian Christians and search and examine it to see whether this is so. Christians are dedicated to proving with evidence what the facts are of Christianity. We don't take this lightly. So many people in a crusade, you know, I asked Jesus to come in my heart, but nothing happened. Well, what Jesus did you ask? What did you believe about him? And sometimes they're at a loss to tell you. They don't know what they're believing about him. Hey, there's a lot of guys down in Mexico named that. Why don't you believe in them? What is this? We have corrupted what the Bible actually says. And we made it something less than what it is. We have no, no reason to, to fear or hesitate anybody's examination of Christianity. And it's interesting that God would say, set your affection, because the mind is what creates the affection. The mind is what controls the emotions. And God's taught that. When he said for you to be renewed, he never said be renewed, renewed in your emotional feelings. He never said that. He said be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind is controlling your emotions. That's why it's very important what goes into our mind as well as what comes out. It is like a computer and you know that. And a lot of us have got a virus in there, amen? It needs to be cleaned out. But you don't need Norton's antivirus program. You need the Lord Jesus and his blood. But we need to understand that when you set your mind on he who is exalted, the right hand of God, you're setting your affection on him. It means you're concentrating, focusing. He's your Lord. He's your master. He's your life. He's your all in all. You don't walk through a day ignoring him. He is the Lord. He is the king. He's the master. And he's a shepherd. And he's a friend. And he cares about you. And he wants you to talk to him. Don't ignore him. He's highly exalted, and every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now Hebrews. Hebrews speaks about the present ministry of our Lord, perhaps in a more detailed way than other books in the New Testament, written to Jewish people who understand priesthood, and before our break, I want you to read with me these three. Just follow along as I read. Hebrews 1, 3. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, nobody else helped him, purged or cleansed our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
Paul's like introducing what's going to be a tremendous discussion. One more verse in chapter 7, verse 25. It's a key verse. After telling us he has an unchangeable priesthood, it says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. In chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. We'll tell you what that means after your break. See you in a few minutes. The class was dismissed for intermission. Now begins second session. Now... The place where he ascended into heaven, we know, was the Mount of Olives. There is a little church marking the place. I don't know where it was. And it's a Sabbath day journey, so it was very close. And, of course, if you've been to Jerusalem, you know Mount of Olives is very close. Uh, some people have argued that because Zechariah 14.4 says that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, that they connect it with this statement in Acts 1.12, that he ascended from the mountain and he'll come back right there on that mountain. Actually, it doesn't say that. All it says is his feet will be there. We're going to learn about this when we talk about the second coming next couple of weeks. But he does not come back to the Mount of Olives first. He'll get up there, but that isn't where he comes first. And you'll find out about that in the next two weeks. Not now. Now, the two main subjects that we want to deal with, and they do present some problems to believers, is the position that he now has in heaven, as well as the purpose behind all of this ascension and present ministry of Christ, which I don't think, as I said earlier, is being dealt with as it should be. It's a very, very important doctrine in the Bible. Why is it important to us? I don't know. There used to be a lot more uh, sermons and messages about it than there are now. But I've given you a list of the passages that deal with his position he now has in heaven. Now, the problem that comes up are usually among evangelical, fundamental believers who believe that he is God. And he is God. And as God, he is omnipresent. If I say I ask Jesus to come into my heart, there's nothing wrong with that because John 14, Jesus said that when I leave, I'm going to send you a comforter and he will come to you. But then he also says, we will come to you and make our abode. He even says the Father and he will make their abode in us. So I guess we should start saying to people, will you ask the Father, the Holy Spirit and Jesus to come into your life right now? That would really confuse people. First of all, the Lord Jesus spoke about being outside the door of the church of Laodicea and said, if any man will open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him, like have a meal together, fellowship, and he with me. So our Lord did teach, did he not, that his presence can be made real in our life even though he ascended into heaven. He is omnipresent, but the question is, is the physical body of Christ omnipresent? And the answer is no, it is not. And that's what most false doctrines and cults tell you. So he winds up being sort of an apparition, an appearance. And if he did it then, he could probably do it now. And it doesn't violate the fact that he's up in heaven in their view. Well, it violates it in my view. The physical presence of Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. It will not be back here until his second coming. The whole point of leaving us gifted leaders, the whole point of his being gone, I'm going away, but I won't leave you comfortless. I'll send the Holy Spirit. The whole point is that he's not here in his physical presence. So those who try to get you to believe, like the lady who had the vision of the Lord showing up in her bedroom, that is nonsense. But do you know there are many, many religious groups that believe that? 
They believe it very powerfully. The Jehovah Witnesses got so twisted in this that they believe he did not have a physical body when he rose from the dead. They say it's an appearance of Jesus. Uh, one time when a Jehovah Witness leader and his trainee came by my house to talk about their beliefs, we got in an argument over the resurrection. And I said, um, give me your Watchtower Bible. He gave me his Watchtower Bible. I turned to Luke 24. I said, I don't know about you guys, but I have trouble with a spirit eating food. It says so right here in your Bible. Oh, well, that's only for our benefit. No, it says he ate. Oh, by the way, he said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. Well, he just did that for their benefit. No, he didn't. And the trainee, I can still remember him. The trainee turned to him and says, you never told me all this. <laughs> that trainee, that, that trainer, the leader, he couldn't wait to get him out of our house. He's about ready to lose his own trainee. So please don't confuse the omnipresent. Now, when we talked about the resurrection, we came right up to a final point in dealing with the evidences. You remember that? If you need to refresh your mind, turn back to page 16, the last point. And that's the assurance in a believer's heart. And I told you, I think just briefly, although I might not have said it, is that I don't count this as very strong evidence, though it is to every believer. But I also think that we don't tell it right. And I'm going to try to explain that now. Because it fits with what we're saying about his ascension and whether or not he pays any personal visits here or there are any appearances of his physical presence to us. You see, if I say to you, I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That song, Since Jesus Came Into Our Heart, My Heart, which, by the way, was a barroom tune that uh, Ira Sankey heard as they were walking by a bar in one city. And he heard this tune. He liked it. And he told Moody he was going to put Christian words to it. Moody was scared to death. Well, what are we going to tell people? First time he sang it. I mean, people just loved it until they found out it was a secular song. And they about crucified him. But it became a popular song to Christians. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. You know that song? And, and I know he lives because he lives within my heart. Yay! Let's say Jesus. Spell it out. Hey, come on. Wait a minute. Couldn't you say I know Buddha lives for the same reason that he lives within my heart? The Mormons who say they have this burning in their heart. Do you understand? It's not a strong evidence. Plus the fact I believe it's not correct. When we interpret the heart as feeling emotions alone, we aren't saying it correct either. If I said to you, you know, I really believe in Jesus with all my head. <laughs> You'd say, oh, head knowledge, huh? You understand what I'm saying to you? We, we get this vocabulary going. We don't explain to people. And can you imagine if you're not a Christian listening to all this as to what, you, what in the world are you saying? You've got to have some sort of little emotional deal with Jesus, and then you're in the in group. What? Come on. Let's start thinking. No, that's not true. What we believe about him is very important. So even the matter of assurance in my heart that he is resurrected and that he now lives is a very uh, difficult evidence to deal with. But I'm going to show you what I think you should believe about it. Okay. Go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 6. This is he who? Jesus, the Son of God. Verse 5. 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, 
but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now we have a debatable passage. Some of you have Bibles that say most ancient authorities don't agree, whatever. Verse 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. See, the Jehovah Witnesses, they will jump on us and say it's not in the best manuscripts. Well, obviously, they want to believe that, because this would be a powerful verse against them. And there are three that bear witness in earth, or on earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Whoa. You read the commentators, and it's unbelievable. They got water as baptism, and the blood as the cross, and, but how does that fit in with the Spirit, and the water, and the blood? I mean, it's just, they get all confused. I suggest you don't read them. Just read the Bible. Now watch. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, that's if and it's so. In other words, that's what we do. Nine out of ten doctors say this is good for you. So we receive the witness of men without even knowing the validity of the product. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word's established. So do we receive the witness of men? Of course we do. Well, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. We would agree. I mean, he's God. He doesn't lie. For this is the witness of God, which he testified of his son. Many people read that verse and forget what it's talking about. What testimony about his son did the Spirit bear witness? Back in verse 6, that he came by water and blood. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness of this in himself. I'm going to explain this to you, the assurance in your heart. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record. The word witness, testimony, record are all the same in Greek. He believeth not the record or witness that God gave of his Son. This is the witness or the record. Here it is. God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Now apparently you've got to believe that he came by water and blood in order to have this. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. What's the issue here? The issue is, what does it mean when Jesus came by water and blood? Because whatever it is, the Spirit bore witness to it, and it's the Spirit that is truth, because God's witness is greater than that of men. What is he talking about? Well, who wrote 1 John? John. He also wrote the Gospel of John. Turn there to chapter 19. And let me show you how the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Have you ever had anybody come up to you and say, you know, my, my spirit just bears witness that there, you know, there's something wrong in your life, you know? Do you know the Bible tells you not to do that? Condemns it. You know, God has revealed to me that there's a spirit of oppression on you. Really? The Bible tells you not to conclude that. You're to judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, and then he will bring to light all the hidden motives and secrets of the heart. As a matter of fact, it's so bad, you yourself don't even know your own motives, so how could somebody else know? That's why we're not supposed to be judging outward appearance and acting like we know somebody's motives. It's like a guy who sat in the front row of my church in Long Beach for years. People said, he's the meanest, ugliest man I ever saw. He was not. He was sweet and kind. He had surgery on his jaw that made his mouth tied up and looked mean and angry. But he was not. He loved the Lord with all his heart. He was a sweet brother, but everybody judged by outward appearance. You, are you listening? Hey, man, you don't look like you feel good. I feel fine. Well, you know, it shows on the countenance, you know, I, I can tell. No, you can't. I didn't sleep well last night. I'm not sick, okay? I'm happy in the Lord. Now get lost. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? We're making these judgments all the time, aren't we? Sure we are. Oh, look at his smile. He must really be a Christian. No, he's a Buddhist, actually. <laughs> he just smiles a lot, you know? And you've been in churches where they say that. Boy, I tell you, if you really love the Lord, let's all show it. By smiling? 
What if I have a broken heart and I just lost my dog or something? You know, why do I have to smile? <laughs> Jesus, we want us to... He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Do you understand me? We say the dumbest things at times. We don't follow the Bible. We just make it all up. Now in John 19, you find the real answer you're looking for and how the Spirit bears witness with your spirit. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Apparently this is the only way to know you're really a Christian. So we're really checking into you right now. John 19, verse 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out what? Blood and water. Who wrote this gospel? John. Who wrote first John? John. Do you think there might be a connection? Now watch what he says. He that saw it bear witness, record, testimony. And his record is true. I was there and I saw it. He knoweth that he saith true, that you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierce. What is the argument here? Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and you can't be saved without it. What's the evidence that he really died on that cross out came blood and water now in many of the commentaries they'll explain the medical issue of the separation of blood and he died of a broken heart etc 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 I'm not interested in that right now I'm taking the Bible just like it says out of him came blood and water proof that he was dead that's why they didn't break his legs which was also a fulfillment of Bible prophecy and the reason the soldier pierced his side, though he did not know it, was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. They will look on him whom they pierced. Zechariah 12.10. Why was he wounded and pierced? Why did he have stripes? All of that, the Bible says, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Pretty powerful, isn't it? We're dealing with a very central issue of the gospel. Now, how do I know it really happened? Because it's in the Bible. Well, then how does the Spirit bear witness that you know you're a Christian? Very simple. If you followed this, folks, you understand how assurance happens. If you're truly a believer and you've been born again, and you read the Bible about something like the death of Christ, if you're born again, the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that's the truth if you're not born again you say oh, I don't believe that do you understand that the way the spirit bears witness with our spirit is not by some spiritual osmosis or you know waves running through the air or in a good church meeting no the spirit bears witness with your spirit as you study God's word when you read what the Bible says about our Lord Jesus, your heart says, that's true. You see, no man can say that except by the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote. Because there are a lot of people in this world that don't believe one ounce of it. Last uh, week I spoke at Adat HaMashiach, Jewish Messianic Fellowship in Irvine and um, we had a lot of guests there and I had invited a lot and so did a lot of other people. I spoke on who is a Jew. And afterwards um, a man who's a Gentile married to a Jewish woman bringing her there, forcing her I think, trying to make out like she's a believer. And he says to me, he says, hey, I want you to talk to her, man. She just, she doesn't, she's already a believer. Please, just, just. I said, hey, you be quiet. I'll find out. So I turned to her and I said, do you believe that Yeshua is the promised Messiah of Israel? She said, I really don't know. 
I said, do you believe that he is God in human flesh? No. Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? Your sins. I can't say that. Do you believe he rose again from the dead in a body? Nobody does that. I turned to him and I said, your wife is not a Christian, but she seems like a lovely lady. If I were you, I'd get a little more honest about this. She right away says, oh, and one other thing. She's talking to him about it. After hearing what I said, because I defended her. She said, one other thing. If you really want to help me, then I want to go listen to this guy. <laughs> now, wherever he teaches, that's where I want to go. And I don't want you telling me what to believe. I'll think about it myself. <laughs> so I invited her to come tonight. I expect her to see her tonight. And then I got to thinking, you know what I'm on tonight are the laws of purity on leprosy. And I'm thinking, she's going to think I'm wacko. But then I got to thinking, wait a minute. King David used leprosy to refer to his own sin when he said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The hyssop plant is what was used in the ceremonial cleansing of the leper as you scrubbed the sore to see if it spread. David said to God, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. So I think we can kind of get the gospel in there tonight as well. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying to you? If you want to know the validity of something and you're a true believer, all you have to do is read it. You know, there's stuff that I read I don't even understand, but I believe it. Have you had that experience? You read this, and boy, that is really amazing. It's, it's God's word, though. I believe it. But wow. I got a few questions, but I believe it. Amen. No, we're not talking about mind over matter or trying to convince yourself of something when you don't honestly know what it says. I'm telling you that if you're truly born again already, when you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit has promised to bear witness, to give you conviction and assurance in your heart that what you're reading is the truth. And it amazes me how unbelievers can read the exact same verses that are precious to us and they don't see what we're so excited about. It's nothing to them. This is crazy. And a lot of us say, well, if you had a new modern English, it would really be a blessing to you. Isn't it interesting how far we've come? No, no, no. If you get the Holy Spirit in you, you'd start understanding it. Even if it was old King James. Amen? Anyway, the position our Lord has in heaven, what is it? Look at the list. Ephesians 4, 8, ascended up on high, verse 10, ascended up far above all, is the word plural or singular, class? Heavens. How many heavens are there? There are three in the Bible that we know of. We remember in 1 Corinthians excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, <coughs> Paul was taken up to the third heaven. So we think there are three. Shirley MacLaine says seven, I believe three. <laughs> Mormons have more, I believe three. But now wait a minute, listen carefully. Our Lord was ascended far above all heavens. The third heaven is supposedly where God dwells. But our Lord is so great, He's ascended above that as well. Hmm. Might tell you why you're going to worship Him in the future. He's by the right hand of God. That's said several times. He's into the heavens. He's standing at the right hand of God. According to Stephen in Acts 7, he must have got up as an encouragement to Stephen because most of the passages say he is sitting. The word to stand up is also the word to rise from the dead. I think maybe Stephen needed that as they stoned him to death. 
Interesting, isn't it? But he's at the right hand of God. And it says many times, especially Hebrews, but also like Colossians, others, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why is that so significant? Why is that keep being pushed? And the answer is really quite simple. In the Old Testament tabernacle and temp temple, no priest ever sat down. There are no chairs. And the picture was of somebody who never finishes his work. So when the Bible says he sat down, by one sacrifice he had offered for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. When he had purged our sins, Hebrews 1, 3, he sat down. You see, every Jew, it was written to the Jews, the Jews would know. Then the work is done. The sacrificial system is over. He sat down. No priest ever sat down except our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, what we have for you at the bottom of the page is probably what you should focus on, that his position in heaven reflects three things, basically. I've already kind of mentioned them in passing, but let's just make sure you got them. One, it reflects God's authority. He's at the right hand. Now, if you want to study that for yourself, look up on your computer, the right hand. And you will see tons of passages. It demonstrates the power and authority and justice and judgment of Almighty God. He's at his right hand. Whoever's at that right hand is the one that's being ordered to carry it out. Does our Lord carry out judgment in behalf of the Father? Absolutely. The Father even gave all judgment unto the Son. Who will be sitting on the great white throne at that judgment of all unbelievers? Our Lord will be sitting there. He is the judge of all the earth. He sat down. The right hand is a position of authority exercising the will of the Heavenly Father. He came to do His will. His position also reflects God's approval. When it says, by His right hand, God exalted Him, highly lifted Him. Lifted Him how big? Above every name that's named. Above all principality, all power, all authority, all thrones, dominions, everything. The Father has exalted Jesus by His ascension. And his position reflects his accomplishment, as we said. He sat down, his work was finished. When he sat on the cross, it is finished, he meant it. The sacrificial system is no more. A lady actually asked me Saturday on the Shabbat at the Jewish Fellowship, do you have a Passover in your home? I said, yes. Do you have a lamb? I said, no. Why not? Because the Lamb of God has already died and paid for all of our sin. It would be an abomination in the sight of God for me to have a lamb on that table. Well, what do you do? Just put a shank bone there as a memory. You don't eat it? Oh, I don't know if you've ever tasted one. I don't eat one. No, just a bone. said interesting I said are you Jewish she said yes I've always wondered why we don't fix a lamb isn't that interesting growing up in a Jewish home why do we have a shank bone there you know what the official Jewish answer is well because we don't have a temple in Jerusalem but she said I'm confused because my rabbi told me that every home is a temple Smart woman. I said, well, I'm sure he's trying to explain it. But I said, the real reason is because we don't have the sacrificial system anymore because it all pointed to the Messiah, who's the Lamb of God, the Redeemer. So we wouldn't do that. She said, that's all. I wanted to talk to her more, but she just, <laughs> you got to learn, you know, and the Jew's done, he's done. He just walks away, you know, bye. Okay. Page 18, the purpose of the ascension and present ministry. This is really a sweet, sweet teaching of the Bible. 
We won't review number one again. Obviously, one of the purposes was his exaltation. So we would all know. I just want to add, in case you need to write it in there, what we said from Philippians 2, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he's Lord. Is it not possible that the reason we're kind of unsubmissive at times is that we aren't setting our affection and our mind on he who has been exalted to the right hand of the throne of God? We forget his exaltation that happened at the ascension, and God wants you to bow the knee to him, to the glory of God. Now, one of the most wonderful things that goes on, and one of the purposes of his ascension, was his intercession for us. Turn to Hebrews 4. We looked at Romans 8, 34, that tells us no one can condemn us because Christ died, is risen, and he's even at the right hand of God. He's praying for you. Oftentimes we ask people to pray for us, and well, we should, but isn't it great to know that you have the greatest prayer warrior praying for you every day? Hebrews 4, 14. I love this passage. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. He constantly refers in Hebrews to his ascension. Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold fast our profession or our confession. Either one, same word. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now we're back to those hymns we told you about. Does Jesus care? I need you every hour, simply trusting thee every day. Is he touched? Yes, with the feeling of our infirmities. In all points, tempted or tested as we are, yet without sin. He had no sin, but yet he knows our struggles. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I need thee every hour. His intercession provides care. Are you hurting? Or do you remember what it was like? And do you remember when somebody really cared? Do you remember what it was like when you shared with somebody how you were hurting and they said, well, yeah, it's great. You know, the Lord take care of that. They walked away and you knew they didn't really care. You remember how it hurt? Or you're trying to share with somebody what, what's going on in your life and they yawn? Oh, I said that was really important to you. Yeah. It's getting late. Uh, how long is your story? You understand? It doesn't minister to your heart. Or you're telling somebody something really heavy and they're talking to somebody else at the same time. Or, you know, hey, excuse me. Hey, John, how you doing? What was that you were saying? Oh, I was just telling you my life's in ruins. Yeah, well, God bless you, man. Yeah, okay. All that hurts. That's hurting you now, huh? <laughs> Aren't you glad that there's someone in the heavens Who's over all who cares? He cares. I like the word care, but I also like the word closeness. It says he intercedes. Do you have a relationship with Jesus where sometimes it, it almost seems like you can feel his breath? You don't, but it feels like it. And sometimes he seems so far away. And God tells you why that is. If there's sin, ugliness, bad attitudes, whatever. Hey, his hand's not shortened. His ear's not heavy. The problem is the sin in your own heart separating you. And, and when you're right with the Lord and you're fellowshipping with him, how close the Lord seems to you. Now, if you don't feel close, guess who moved? It wasn't him. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I like that. I need his care. And I need his closeness. He ever lives to inter intercede. And I like the word continuity. Just to make them all seize. He ever lives to make it. He continues. He never has stopped. There is never a day that he doesn't pray for you. 
Isn't that great? Imagine what he sees, what you're into. Oh, what grief must come. No wonder the Bible says our sinful attitudes can grieve the Holy Spirit. As he's this person as, as real as you are. Continuity. He continues forever, the Bible says. Never stops interceding. And I like the word conquer or conquest. Why? Because there's somebody up there accusing you day and night also. The devil, the accuser, accuses the brethren day and night. And Jesus calls himself at the right hand of God an advocate. It's an old Greek word for defense attorney. We still use it today, don't we? Lawyers are called advocates. He's a defense attorney. He's defending you. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb. But imagine, the devil's accusing you before God, night and day. I don't know if he has a long scroll with your name on it or what. But he's constantly telling the Lord why you're nothing but trash. Look at the way they act. And Jesus is up there. <laughs> yeah, but I died for them. See, I paid it. And who can condemn? It's Christ that died and rose again. Who's ever at the right hand of the throne of God. Making intercession. Isn't that great? Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad? Well, something else, his preparation in John 14. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Now watch out. Some believe when it says I go to prepare a place is referring to him going to the cross, which makes it possible for you to have a place in heaven. Others believe that, no, he was saying, I'm going up to heaven and going to build your mansion. I don't know which one is true. All I know is he's working in my behalf. And I say glory. And one day he said, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Now why would he say in my father's house are many mansions if he didn't mean it? Now some of you have the new ASB and others have the word dwelling places because that's the word. And if you like dwelling place, God help you. I've read the end of the story in Revelation 21, 22. Those are not just some old shack in heaven. That's a beautiful city we're going to be a part of. So if you want to have an old shack, go ahead. But I'm going to have a mansion. I think old King Jimmy was right on. In my father's house are many mansions. And dwelling place does not do it for me. I've been in a lot of crummy dwelling places in my life. Okay? But you know, there's something else about his exaltation and present ministry that I think we're forgetting. I don't know why we don't teach it more. It's what I call his fullness as the head of the church. For example, in Ephesians, we read in chapter 1 about his ascension. And notice the context. He ascended far above all principality and power. And then verse 22 says, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In Colossians he said, Christ is all in all. Is that true? Sure it's true. It's in the Bible, but do you understand that? The fullness. What is the church? It's the life of Jesus Christ. You know, there's an old Catholic statement that says the church is an extension of the incarnation. I don't often like what they describe and doctrinally, but there's something to that. God became flesh and dwelt among us. He ascended to heaven. Now God dwells. Our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. But is all the fullness of God in your one body? No. He says in the church we see the fullness of Christ's life. You know something about Jesus. I don't know. He's done something in your life he hadn't done in mine. And I know things about him you don't know. And together it forms the fullness of the life of Christ in every one and in every situation. Jesus doesn't sit in heaven like the Dia says, uh, winding history up like a clock and just watching it unwind. 
No, he's actively involved in every one of our lives. Your life is going to become so much more meaningful as a Christian if by faith you walk that way. Walk by faith, not by sight. The Lord Jesus wants to live his life in you. Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory. You want a neat Bible study sometime? Take the words in Christ or in him. Unbelievable. Do you realize how often that is in the epistles? What is it to be a Christian? It's having Jesus Christ living in your life. We might say through the power of the Holy Spirit, through what I know about him, what I've read about him in the Bible, but we also know because he's omnipresence in terms of spiritual presence in a real sense, the Lord Jesus himself has made his life possible in me. Of course, the truth of the matter is my physical life comes from him as well as my spiritual life. It's really what it means to be born again. The fullness of the Lord Jesus. I love Colossians 2, 9 that says the fullness of God dwells in him in bodily form. All of it. Then it says ye are complete. It's the same word fullness filled up in him who's the head of all principality and power. He said ye, not thee. In other words, only the corporate body of believers experiences the fullness of the life of the Lord. That's why we need each other. Why we can't walk alone. But one more thing, and that's his expectation. 1 Corinthians, we'll use that text and then we need to quit. 1 Corinthians 16, or 15, 24 to 28. You know that everything including unbelievers every part of this world and its system is all going to be put under the dominion and authority of Jesus Christ during his millennial reign he'll be calling all the shots he will be in charge he will not have a cabinet there will be no CNN to report on it He's going to establish his kingdom on earth and we're going to rule and reign with him. When he ascended into heaven, he was exalted. That isn't the end of the story. Verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 15, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death itself. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it's manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. The Father will never be put under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. Now watch this. That God may be all in all. Do I understand that? No. Do I believe it? Absolutely. Apparently, someday, after the millennial reign of Christ, when he exercises his authority over all things that will be put under his headship, then he's going to deliver all things back to the Father in some dramatic way that the whole world will know that the plan of human history began and ends in the heart of a father. How about that? So the ultimate objective of God the Father is that we would worship and praise Him forever. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We'd be so lost without it. Help us, Lord, to understand the present ministry of our Lord who's ascended into heaven and one day will come again. And in our expecting of His coming again, may we not ignore and neglect His intercession, His care, His comfort, His compassion for us now. It is a throne of grace that we come to now, not a throne of judgment. Where we find mercy, God holding back from us what we really deserve, 
and grace God giving us what we don't deserve. Grace to help in time of need. Lord, may we see our need and bring it to you. As the song said, I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. Help us to believe that and to apply it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.